And Tim, just to brief a, a brief overview of what you have done before, you were involved in the small biotech, uh, and you moved to Pfizer. So that's one change, but at the same time, it's very important because you can bring perspectives coming from the two sides. Uh, and what I really wanted to start the discussion with is about the scope um, of, of the Pfizer stem cell unit. Could you tell us what is new scientist today, what it was initially, um, in terms of indication, focus, and in terms of platforms? Okay, um, this one, hope everyone can hear me. Um, so, so Alan was right, so I joined Pfizer about five years ago, and um, I was the former chief scientific officer of a stem cell-based technology company, uh, based in Edinburgh, and then we had some facilities in Cambridge. And um, when I started in Pfizer 2009, it was about a year after Pfizer had made a strategic decision to invest in regenerative medicine. And so it had established this sort of nascent group of people on a bioscience park in Cambridge, Granter Park, where we're still today. And uh, it set forth to actually build the skills and expertise, recruit people with a sort of stem cell background, both in terms of um, R&D exper experience as well as sort of business acumen. And um, we actually set forth also with a strategy in mind, which was to really evaluate the field, the space, I guess, in a four-platform type approach. So the four, four platforms at the time were a small molecule-based uh, stimulation of intrinsic regeneration, autologous cell therapy, um, allogeneic um, somatic cell-based therapy, and um, pluripotent stem cell um, therapy, certainly in terms of pluripotent stem cells, is the sort of the basis, the raw materials for developing a cell therapy. So what we did was um, um, to actually then uh, go through fairly extensive evaluation of what's in the external space. So we identified, you know, good opportunities for collaboration because it was clear that we weren't going to have sufficient uh, time window plus also resources to actually build de novo. So we had to have a sort of hot start as you might say. Um, and two of the key uh, collaborations that we made were in the cell therapy space. So one was with Athesis, and the second one was with the um, uh, Institute of Ophthalmology uh, here in London, the Moorfields Eye Hospital, and that was with the academic group of Pete Coffey, who was making uh, retinal pigmented epithelial cells for um, AMD treatment from human embryonic stem cells. Um, and and uh, so, so we set forth doing also uh, a number of um, key sort of preclinical experimental evaluations with um, stem cells, um, plus then also embarked upon the design and funding and implementation of uh, this key study that was the topic of initial conversation this morning, which was the phase two study for ulcerative colitis with athesis. Um, and perhaps you want to come back to that in the subsequent questions. I think, I think it's important also, though, just to consider you know, the broader expanse, if you like, of stem cell approaches within Pfizer. Um, so, so we also use currently, and at the time of the formation of the unit, stem cells as tools quite extensively. Uh, human embryonic stem cells making um, uh, different uh, lineages, and at the time there was also a preclinical research collaboration with Biocide. Um, to make um, uh, pancreatic beta islet progenitor cells from HES cells as well. So, so you know, we had that, that approach, um, and um, to this day still, although we are interested in further sort of tools use of uh, human pluripotent stem cells, really the emphasis has shifted in Cambridge more towards IPS cells. And one of the key activities I have at the moment is to coordinate on behalf of Pfizer a big by my Innovative Medicines Initiative funded multi-partner project to actually make, bank and distribute um, disease specific and um, genetically variant uh, IPS cells for, for major applications. Um, so, so that I hope gives you a, a span of um, what we do with stem cells in Cambridge then and now, but then also of course stem cells are used, as you might imagine, quite extensively across a broad range of different research units and partner lines. Uh, pharmaceutical sciences, research, drug safety, etc., um, within the company as well. Okay, brilliant. Uh, now, if we could go back a little bit earlier in the history of the genesis of, of Pfizer's interest in regenerative medicine, 
what was the defining moment? I mean, Rose McCallum was really uh, uh, a strong advocate of this, in terms of Pfizer, but it's interesting to understand the uh, hurdles that you have in a pharmaceutical company. So a little bit in, in, a, in a few, in a few. Yeah. Sides. So, so I think, um, of course, I don't, I don't know all the decision-making processes at the time. I mean, I'm imbibed, if you like, a lot as I've been with Pfizer. I mean, clearly, crucially, as you mentioned, it takes key people thinking about the, you know, having the right philosophy at the right time. Rupert Kernan is, you know, was and remains a key catalyst, passionate advocate for the use of stem cells as tools, plus also potentially as therapists within the organisation. And then it's also having, at the time, the right um, influencers talking with the key business people high up in the uh, levels of the organisation to actually, you know, have those key discussions and um, um, actually take some um, measured risks, formulate a strategy, and then play that strategy out to see what benefits can accrue. Right? And, and I think this is, you know, this was typical of Pfizer at the time. It remains actually a feature of Pfizer, but of course also at the time, um, which was beneficial but not necessarily um, always useful at the time, was the fact that Pfizer was also closing the wire acquisition. So there was. I think um, a lot going on, and that actually significantly ramped up in terms of you know, significant changes and rearrangements in terms of, um, I guess, R&D and also management and strategy, etc. cetera, um, in subsequent years, which may have, I think, reflected perhaps um, not so well on the further evolution of that initial strategy. Okay, good, so we have a, a combination of uh of passion by individuals, a combination of strategic uh, decisions, but also a combination of tactical considerations as well, all, 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 all played at the same time. It's interesting because Pfizer already made a, sust uh, a sustainable, sustainable investment in the field, uh, and a major one. But what were also the specific goals that Wolves and the initial founders of this scientists and, and now that you have uh, for those scientists in terms of novel products, uh, and in particular in terms of therapy? So that's quite clear. Yeah, so 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 Nucentis actually is a, a current day moniker. Nucentis means new science therapeutics. At the time when regenerative medicine kicked off, it wasn't called Nucentis, right? Um, and so actually the goals of Nucentis currently are probably could be viewed as much more conventional in terms of like large pharma research unit, where we work from research all the way through to clinical POC in terms of I guess uh, processing a balanced portfolio of different uh, drugs and mechanisms. The principal focus at the moment is pain research. Okay? And, and we have a key expertise currently um, across our two sites. We have a site in Cambridge, we also have a site uh, in, in North Carolina, which was the former Icogen um, biotech company. We have a key expertise in iron channel physiology and pharmacology. So at the moment, of course, we have um, the majority of what we do, which is conventional, small molecule approaches, um, but we also have um, the ongoing um, trial, we, and I should say ongoing, and emphasize that, an ongoing experiment with Aphesis, right? Um, and then we also have this other cell therapy product, uh, which is a local collaboration, but the majority of what we do is, is small molecule based at the moment. Okay. So he said, it would be fair to say that new scientists is, is a center of excellence in everything that is emerging technology and linking essentially those to the rest of the greater Pfizer organization. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily use the moniker center of excellence. What I would say is that we have an individuality, I would say, um, in terms of, again, it being a reflection of individual drives an ability to place a strategy that plays through, you know, within the global R&D organisation. Um, and there are some principal people driving that. And in terms of, is there anything you can tell us regarding the resources, uh, in terms of budget, in terms of people involved, uh, that you work for, for uh, regenerative medicine particularly? Okay. So, so again, there was the past and there's the current. Um, you're asking the wrong person in terms of research topics. <laughs> but, let's, but in terms of then, when regenerative medicine started, it grew rapidly actually to a modest group of uh, scale of people in terms of FTE. So it's probably at its peak was um, I don't know, 30 to 40 
folks you know, who do an R&D with a strong sort of stem cell focus. Um, now, actually, the group is probably at the most maybe 10 to 12 people, so it has shrunk in size. And again, that is proportional to, again, the difference in terms of strategy and portfolio that we have compared with them. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't know actually what that accumulates to uh, in terms of research dollars spent on stem cells, importantly, within the wider organisation, which obviously encompasses incentives. Yeah, very nice. Uh, one question regarding your, your reach towards uh, the academic community. How do you plan to uh, accessing technologies or accessing leaders that can help? Yeah, so, so when I first joined Pfizer, one of the key remits I was given was to um, do technology evaluation. So we needed to you know, develop, and we did this to Nova, develop you know, tools and mechanisms to rapidly, well, literally within days, um, evaluate new opportunities that were coming into our email trays. Um, so I sort of coordinated an activity where we were uh, triaging, um, ev well, evaluating opportunities, technology assessments, if you like, technology as well as potential clinical assets, um, prioritising them, triaging them, and then escalating them for decision making within the organisation, so within the research organisation, and then critically as with any large pharma unit, research unit, at least a partner with the business unit. Um, so where appropriate in terms of if it was a relatively middle to late stage potential opportunity, then we would need to have immediate dialogue with the business unit. Um, so the business units typically would then step in to work with the research unit to fund, you know, phase three trials and beyond through to market approval. Um, and, and actually this, this brings or raises another interesting feature, I think, about the um, cultural difference, I would say, between biotech elements, components for this community and large pharma culture or philosophy. Because, you know, one of the, um, should we say, nice challenges that we have still to this day, but certainly at the time, was actually you know, going through this process of influencing people in the business unit, business units, um, helping them understand fundamentally what the key elements of you know, important science um, and technology that underpins these assets is, and then also helping them understand where the value proposition is and where the value added will accrue from what we would do and develop in the research unit. And, and, it, was, and it remains a challenge, right? I mean, it's, it's actually, uh, these, are, these are people in the business units who we talk to which are you know, very familiar and they have their um, yardsticks or measures for assessing value, evaluating you know, chemical assets, drugs and biologics, but this is very unfamiliar territory in terms of living cells and tissues as a therapy. And, and that has been, I think, you know, a, a good acute learning curve for us in the research unit as well as probably some business unit. Okay, great. So essentially, you know, the notion plays a role of interface with the rest of the academic community to, to bring on board uh, various uh, technologies. Now, let's go back, obviously, to, to a question that everybody has regarding partnering. Uh, particularly, uh, you, you have uh, that trial with Bertie's, uh, uh, which is very exciting, as you see, uh, particularly. You have uh, the ongoing trial with Atasis. Uh, uh, two questions. The first one is really, uh, first, do you plan to increase the number of strategic alliances in that field uh, over the years, right? Uh, but most importantly, maybe let's focus first on why you are with Atasis. If you could describe in some terms uh, uh, Okay, so, so actually what I'll start with is the RPE project actually, and then I'll move to Atlas as well. So, so the, um, the current situation with the RPE collaboration is that we have regulatory approval here in the UK. Uh, the product is being manufactured um, at this moment in time. We anticipate soon to get into you know, the first patients. Um, and I think today is timely because there is a press release um, made this morning um, describing how Roslyn cells up in Edinburgh will take on the manufacturing, the expansion of the GMP grade human polypropylene stem cells, which is the raw material to this product. Um, so that's that. I think is you know local, tangible illustration of ongoing investment for that particular project, and that's that's great to see. Um, with respect to the uh, ongoing Athesis collaboration, so so there was a number of interesting comments 
made this morning. And of course, you know, you have to you have to view the context in which those comments were made. Um, but this is an ongoing collaboration. It's an ongoing experiment. Um, we uh, still believe in in the partnership that this was um, a pretty well designed, you know, clinical um, study. Uh, at the time when we entered into it, it was a uh, a leading uh, uh, product in this category. So the good combination of two factors there. Um, you know, I think the choice of indication was because Pfizer was very comfortable. It has a pedig pedigree in terms of successful trial deployment with respect to Crohn's and ulcerative um, colitis. In fact, currently it probably has three or four separate mechanisms that it's actually testing in advanced stage clinical studies for that indication. Um, so, so I think you know we need to bear that in mind. So it kind of makes sense at the time. Still makes sense. Um, and you know what? So, so what the current situation is is actually quite positive. Of course, you know when it was announced, there was disappointment on both sides in terms of what what the um, what the uh, first analysis, the interim analysis of the, the data set was showing in terms of the uh, active arm versus placebo. Um, but that was just um, from analysis of data from the egg week follow-up, you know, following the last dose. Um, what is currently ongoing is analysis of data from a 16-week follow-up, and actually, which would include patients, a sub-cohort of patients, which have received a repeat dose of the product. Right? So, so while, of course, at the time, it's disappointing that there wasn't a stronger effect seen, um, you know, I think the... Um, you have to, you know, I guess, reserve final judgment until the final data set is reviewed and, and the announcement is made. But I think also there are many positive features of, of what has been done, right? Because, again, there was a strong partnership. You know, many key fundamental features that you anticipate to see in a strong alliance between Pfizer and Biotech existed and still exist at the time. So a very strong science culture, very strong science interaction. Um, uh, acute technology assessment, precise technology assessment, and then also good clinical design and execution. Um, and um, and uh, you know I think that um, you know, what we're hoping to see is um, where this will then lead the organisation. You know, once that final data set and analysis is performed, in terms of that you know key next decision step, right? and one can imagine that there are a number of options there. Right. At the moment, it's you know, definitively not possible to say because this is, again, um, an ongoing experiment. Okay, but that, that's excellent news. I mean, it's, it's very important to have the Pfizer obviously continue to be engaged in, in stem cell therapeutics. It's, uh, it's clear that nobody ever said that uh, putting a clinical trial is ever easy. There are always surprises along the way, and, and that's part of what Pfizer can bring in terms of. Uh, so, so, actually, I have to get a I forgot a very important point also. <laughs> what the initial data analysis has demonstrated is that the product is safe and tolerated, right? Which was, you know, Which is a, a, key, a key feature for big pharma to understand. Right. Uh, and, and as I was mentioning earlier this morning, that, uh, we need to think of technology as curves that we have to, to, to go through to bring the right uh, efficacy. But essentially, the clinical trial is still ongoing. We have seen some good hopes of Pfizer. This is an experiment. Uh, and, and uh, you have the right through the partnership that you have in place with Avertis to expand to additional indications to challenge the, uh, number, uh, the doses, the uh, blood process, and, and so on. So you have a lot of uh, latitude essentially to make this work. Um, another question that I think probably will interest uh, uh, the entrepreneurs uh, in the audience is do, is Pfizer engaged in, in creating startups in fields of strategic interest and obviously particularly? Um, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think generally for any organisation of this size and dimension, it has a multitude of different um, sort of business opportunities that it can play out. You know, from R&D collaborations, licensing opportunities, through to uh, venture investment in early stage startups. Um, you know where colleagues in the venture investment group obviously would have different motivations for undertaking that, you know, in terms of return on that initial investment, 
but nonetheless, um, you know, their their landscape is very broad. You know, so they would look at a broad range of technologies and um, new spin outs, new codes, etc. Um, and and also, you know, although I know less about that, I can well imagine that an organisation again of this scale has um, um, an opportunity to consider how it might actually spin out companies itself. So uh, and the process to to engage Pfizer on startups is both school and some of these particular, which will be called like yourself or your collaborator? Well, so actually, no, we have a specialised group of people in a different part of the organisation. Um, it's actually, it probably is best viewed as being initially seeded and assessed in what we call the External R&D Innovations Group. So they, they're a group of specialist uh, technology assessors plus also business people who work sort of across all research units. Right? So if you look at any kind of modality, any type of modality, any disease indication area, any new type of technology, then these were people who you initially interface with in terms of being introduced formally, if you like, to what the opportunity is. Um, and they would you know, make the decision, I guess, how best to siphon, if you like, the opportunity into the relevant part of the organization, whether it's, you know, very early stage, but you know, tremendously exciting, and that goes into venture investment versus something which is, um, you know, a validated technology, but is yet still preclinical in stage. Then you know, there's an opportunity to bring it into research unit. If it's, if it's, you know, there's already a good quality phase two uh, clinical data set on something, then that would typically go straight to the business unit. So changing bracket a little bit and similarity to, to uh, startups, but the fundamental uh, IP that is necessary is, uh, what is Pfizer view of having open innovation or participating in consortia uh, for stem cell therapeutics um, Yeah, so, so first of all, it's very positive, right? And actually, um, <coughs> here in Europe, Pfizer has a rich heritage of being involved in non-competitive, multi-partner, European Union funded research. So we have a lot, actually quite a large portfolio of IMI projects. Um, to my knowledge, we don't have any kind of smaller scale European funded projects that we're working but certainly the IMI, the Innovative Medicines Initiative portfolio of projects, we have a large number of those that we're involved in. Um, so we're clearly comfortable in terms of the philosophy and the mentality that we required to actually work non-competitively with other stakeholders in, in whatever sort of, you know, field is the subject matter of that particular project. Okay. Um, now, let's get closer to the product. What do you think is, uh, as the most critical success factors for regenerative medicine, uh, for the point of view of a big pharma? Yeah, so, so I, I, I think, you know, it's kind of um, obvious to say it because it's already been said so far this morning, but issues of, you know, cost of goods, the ease of manufacturing, the efficiency of manufacturing, you know, um, I guess questions still reside as to um, how long it will take, you know, probably optimistically it will happen, but how long it might take to reach a point in terms of how these products are made, which is similar to the um, scale and the and efficiencies of making pills or biologics, right, in terms of, you know, the cost of goods and the margins associated with those. So, so those are some of the factors, but then also, you know, a key area of uncertainty for a large company is the issue of, again, you know, who's going to pay for them and how they're going to be, I guess, eventually deployed in healthcare services globally, right? Um, and, and obviously, again, firmly believe, support, endorse what was said this morning about the interconnectability, if you like, between regulatory approval and, and reimbursement. And actually, that's clearly one of the benefits a partnership with a big pharma can, can bring to a, a growing company, which is also competencies in manufacturing, in marketing, in regulatory, and all the different perspectives that make a product, and thinking also in terms of formulation and logistics, where you have experts at, at, uh, at all big pharma like Pfizer, uh, and, and those competencies are clearly not always present in, uh, in big That's true. So again, I, and I think I'll probably use the example of the collaboration here with Anthesis, so both sides have learned a lot from this collaboration. Right? So you know, we like to think that we've uh, provided you know, how to do uh, a well-designed clinical study and execute it at scale in terms of number of patients. You know, we hope that we've helped Atlasis along in terms of that. And then also, likewise, we've learned a lot from Atlasis in terms of, um, I guess, how they've approached the 
development of their multi-stem vaccine technology into multi-stem. So, so I think so. I think it's been a you know, strong mutual understanding, and, and I think it will need to continue as such uh, going forward to actually accelerate the um, development of this field, maybe in cell and tissue therapies, um, for a while yet. So we, we do have to anticipate further bumps in the road. I don't think these are going to be major showstoppers, but there'll be bumps in the road. And, um, and I think also that nurtures a lot more creativity. So people will have to think differently uh, and probably harder about how to actually you know, reach those goals in terms of um, making this an industry of you know, what we're now familiar with in terms of therapeutic antibodies. Right. And if you agree, we're going to take a, a question or two from the audience, but before, before we reach that point, and I say that so you can prepare a question that you have, burning question that you have for Pfizer. Uh, question about, because we talk about passion, we talk about the people behind creating a new regenerative medicine unit at Pfizer, starting the project. Uh, what is what is impacting of the corporate culture? And, and first, the question is more about how can you through the scientists permeate all the learnings that we talked about just now through the greater Pfizer organization, so essentially you reach uh, cultural resonance at all the levels of the organization, from uh, mid-sized management to upper level management, from research to business, including marketing. So everybody understands the potential, the transformational potential of this unit. Yeah, so, so as an individual actually working now for five years in, in a big pharma, uh, what I've realized actually is that they are continuously changing their um, approach to making sure that people are able to express themselves fully and be able to, you know, not necessarily, you know, um, sort of fit into silos and just be too comfortable in terms of how they, you know, um, talk with people and influence people in the organisation. And, and Pfizer, like many pharma companies, is is rejuvenating the way and continues to do that in terms of how it, it wants its, its colleagues, its employees, to think about taking calculated risks, right? In, at any scale, really. You know, from you know, people doing R&D as well as all the people up to high level management. Um, so that, that's a key feature. I, I think also, um, Something that has happened in Pfizer from five years ago is a migration towards much more of a sort of biotech-like feel to it, and, and I think you know there's a there's an element of real manifestation of this in in that certain units, research units in Pfizer, work like biotech companies. They work like biotech units, and of course, you know, Pfizer has merged with acquired biotech companies and has actually maintained them autonomously almost, but within the global R&D organisation. So I give you the example of uh, the former Ipigen company that is now part of New Centers, but then we also have a, a, an organization called Rhino, which is part of the global R&D organization based in California, but they have, they have their original sort of biotech uh, feature to them. So, so I think overall there's been a shift, a very useful, productive, successful shift towards a more biotech-like approach to the way that um, Big Pharma do R&D. Okay, well, yeah. So it's, it's, it's critical to understand that pharmaceutical companies are, are very dynamic companies, in fact. And the way pharma are doing business has changed over the years, right? If we recall in 2000, before 2000, it was not inventive, inventive years anymore. Now that's probably got into the future of these organizations. Partnering is a key. And registered medicine companies, biotech companies <coughs> are transformational products, right? So the thinking, and I think it's important to realize that. What Tim has explained for the thinking of a company like Pfizer has significantly evolved since five years ago and more open essentially to partnership. But there are quite a few other as well here, yeah, including the product we need to have a product with market. I just would like to check if, if there is anybody who has a question for Tim. Great, so everyone completely understands what I've been saying. It's fantastic. <laughs> yes, it seems so. I've done my job. Oh, there's one here. <laughs> Uh, say 
protection, safety, and the So, I mean, first and foremost, well, well, thank you. I mean, first and foremost, you know, for any large farmer, is you know, patient concerns in our first right. So, it's in terms of whatever it develops, needs to think about the patient and safety. All right. Okay, we're going to quickly take one last question, and we're going to uh, ask our second speaker to come. Yes. Just going back to Africans and answering clients' trial. Price's perspective of the widely not adapted, adapted trial design and looking back at trial design now, what would you do differently? Would you do anything differently? Um, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> You're probably asking that of the wrong person. So, so you know, I can speak about what we've been doing and what we are doing, but I, I haven't been part of the clinical design team. So, you know, undoubtedly those sorts of questions were asked at the time. Right? Um, and at the time, the best decision was made in terms of how to structure the design. Um, I can't really say much more than that, actually. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, everything that we're familiar with in terms of this community as to novel approaches, you know, adaptive designs for clinical studies for these types of products, um, you know, how, how you might um, stratify the disease, identify a sub cohort of patients will give you the maximal prospect of demonstrating an effect and what that effect size might be. You know, I think that's another critical factor. And actually what I haven't mentioned, but it's important, it's not you know, unique to Pfizer, but many farmers, including Pfizer, are focusing much more now in terms of what they develop in a precision medicine approach, which you know, lends itself to.